Welcome to our home. Um, this week, on my thoughts, I'd like to examine the concept of tshuva, repentance. Uh, saying to God that you are really sorry for your previous transgressions and asking him for forgiveness. So the lecture will be about, are you really sorry? You know, recently, a friend of mine lost his beloved wife to cancer. He told me that she had undergone chemotherapy and, and that she was fighting to live as long as possible. As you can imagine, her loving family suffered with her, watching helplessly as she fought for her life. Then on the same day that she died, her doctor had told my friend in the morning that her condition had improved and that she was now ready to be discharged and that he could take her home later that day. Her doctor said that she was ready to leave the hospital. Later that same day, she had a seizure and she died in the hospital. Hearing him tell me the story broke my heart. His hearts and hopes and his prayers were shattered by reality. She died. You know, a few years ago, my younger brother, a blessed memory, passed away. His death was sudden. He had worked out with his trainer in the morning. He was in relatively good health and had no real health issues. His weight was good. And there was no reason to assume that he would die suddenly. He was preparing to go to work. And when his wife went upstairs to see why he hadn't come downstairs yet, she found him dead on their bed. At the time, though I was heartbroken, you know, I thought that to myself that he was really lucky. It's difficult to get into this world, and many times it's even more difficult getting out. So many people suffer before they can leave this world and move on to their reward in the world to come in paradise. I felt that my brother had beaten the odds since he had managed to exit this world without the long, drawn-out pain and suffering that most people experience as they continue on their journey of life. So reflecting on these two scenarios, of one of pain and suffering and, and then death, of passing on to the next world quickly, without surgery, chemotherapy, and needles, and all the pain and discomfort that are associated with any life-ending illness. I thought to myself, not, not that we really have a choice, but that my brother was lucky to die as quickly as he did. True, it was a shock to his beloved wife and children, but nonetheless, I felt that he had dodged a bullet. It was as if the door to paradise was left unattended for a moment, and he availed himself of the opportunity and snuck in when no one was looking. So, given the choice between a kick, quick passing or having to experience long-term pain and discomfort before one passes on, well, which one would you choose? I think that our first choice would be a quick passing. After all, who wants to suffer? But then I thought to myself, you know, would that be the correct answer? I often advise people to play the long game, not the short one. The long-term benefits of sickness and pain, though they may not be pleasant, may well outweigh the short-term benefits of a quick and painless passing. We read in the Torah in the portion of Korach that as a punishment for his actions, Korach was swallowed up in the earth while he was still alive. And then he was brought, back, brought down directly to purgatory. Korach was not given an opportunity to repent. That was his punishment for organizing the rebellion against Moshe death without any chance to do tshuva, repentance. Our sages tell us that the week before God Almighty brought the flood and destroyed the world was a week filled with the joys of paradise. God, as a benevolent father, tried to give the generation one last chance to repent. They did not, and the world was destroyed. It is always God's preference to destroy the sin and not the sinner. I believe that when people are suffering a serious illness, one that threatens their life, that it forces them to turn to God for his blessing, and then they pray for a speedy recovery. I would think that most people make all kinds of propositions and promises to God Almighty about changing their errant ways. You know, they try to convince God that if he blesses them with a complete recovery, that they will become a better person. I do believe that God listens. It is possible for a person to gain their entrance into the world to come even in the last moments of their life. The Talmud in the Tractate of Avodah Zarah 
tells the story of a, of a, a Lazar ben Dardoya. It was said of him that there was not one prostitute in all the towns on the seashore that he had not frequented. Once, after being with a woman, she passed gas. She looked up at him and told him what a low life he was. She said that just as the gas she passed would never return, so too. He had sunk so low that there was no longer any path open for him to attain forgiveness. While well, the Talmud states that taking her words to heart, he turned to the heavens and then to the earth. He approached the mountains and then the seas. He asked each of them to advocate on his behalf before God Almighty. They all declined, saying to him that they had their own issues and needed that needed to be dealt with. Having no other alternative, he put his head down between his knees and he began to cry. He cried until his soul departed. After his passing, there was a heavenly voice that called out, we are now welcoming the soul of Rabbi Elazar ben Dordoya into heaven. The Talmud states that when Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, the leader of their generation, heard this story, well, he began to cry. He said that this individual was able to acquire in a moment what I struggled to attain in a complete lifetime. In addition, the heavenly voice afforded him the title of Rebbe, which he was not on earth. How great is the power of teshuva, of repentance. If we look into the Torah, we witness an interesting fact. It was our forefathers, Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that requested that God create old age, sickness, and a deathbed experience. But why? They seem like a strange requests. The Medrash tells us that until the time of Abravina, Abraham, our father, that people would mature until the age of 20, and then they would continue to appear that, like that, as if they were in their 20s, for the rest of their lives. Avraham felt that if a person were to develop gray hair and wrinkles, that it might be seen as a wake-up call. They might come to the realization that the clock is ticking, and that they should get their lives together before they die. And so, Avraham Vino asked God Almighty to create old age. Yitzhak Avino, Isaac, our father, was the first individual in history to experience sickness. Sickness that promoted bodily pain and discomfort, not necessarily death. A natural death would occur only when a person would sneeze. They would sneeze and then they would die. This may be the reason why even today that we still bless any individual when they sneeze in some form of blessing, such as Gesundheit, or God bless you. This is a response that's limited only to sneezing. It's interesting, I used to think that when a person sneezed, their heart stopped, which is not the case. But then I came to the realization man was created by God breathing into his nostrils the breath of life. And there's nothing more forceful that a person does of pushing air out than a sneeze. So the sneeze was giving back God, so to speak, his breath. And that's why it brought death. Yitzchak felt that when a person feels strong and healthy, that the tendency is for them to take life for granted. They feel like they are immortal and that they will live forever. Sickness is another wake-up call, alerting us to the fact that our biological clock is ticking and that we do not have forever. As the saying goes, there is no atheist in a foxhole. Pain. Pain forces a person to turn to God Almighty. They pray to Him in the hope that God will mitigate any pain that they are experiencing. They request of him that he should bless them with a long and healthy life. And if not that, that they should at least pass on to the next world with as little pain and discomfort as possible. Then Yaakov, you know, Jacob, our father, asked God for a deathbed experience. Up until his demise, sickness was the cause of pain, but it was not necessarily the cause of death. Yaakov Avinu, Jacob our father, was the first person mentioned in the Torah who experienced a prolonged sickness and then death. He asked God for this scenario so that a person would put his house in order, so to speak, before they moved on to the next world. It allowed the patients to say his, their final goodbyes, an opportunity to tie up loose ends in their lives. It is also a way for God to help the family to release their fingers from their beloved one's life 
and pray for an end to their loved one's pain and suffering. We read in the Torah in the portion of Ayechi that Yaakov Inu blessed all 12 of his sons shortly before he died. Before Yaakov Inu's death, people would customarily prepare for their deaths whenever they would enter within five years of the death of either of their parents. As we read in the Torah, with the story of Yitzhak, who blessed his sons, Yaakov and Esau, when he was only 123 years old, even though he lived until the age of 180. He did so since his mother, Sarah, had died at the age of 127. So given a choice of a painful exit or a quick transition into the next world, you know, I think most of us would opt for the later, latter. However, I think that we would be wrong. Our sages tell us that any suffering that we experience in this world is seen as a form of kapara, atonement for all the Torah commandments that we have transgressed during our lifetimes. Pain is therefore not without a positive purpose. Still, we may not volunteer to experience any. But as the saying goes, no pain, no gain. In addition, when a person is sick, they become much like a Torah scroll or a pair of tefillin. They become a holy object, since other people pray for their recovery and attend to their needs. So it is through their sickness that they encourage other people to do mitzvot, good deeds. So even a person who is lying in a coma receives reward for being the catalyst for the prayers and the charity that others offer on their behalf. Even though they may not be conscious and are unable to perform any mitzvot themselves, no moment of life is wasted. Every moment is precious and has a positive purpose. As I, thought, as I thought about the circumstances surrounding the death of my friend's wife, you know, I wondered, how could a doctor be so wrong? He thought that she was ready to be discharged from the hospital in the morning, and yet she died that afternoon. You know, doctors are highly trained individuals. How is it that their diagnoses are at times <clears throat> excuse me, so incorrect? It is not unusual for a person who is terminally ill to show signs of recovery only to pass away shortly. I believe that when a person is seriously ill, it would only be logical for them to turn to God Almighty for salvation. They try to negotiate deals and promises with them about <clears throat> what they will do if they are given another chance at life. I think that God listens to their prayers and then allows them to experience hope that they may well recover. You know, there was a movie years ago, a comedy, with Burt Reynolds. He played a man who wanted to kill him, someone to kill him. In the movie, all of the attempts failed, and finally he decided to take matters into his own hands. So he goes out to the ocean, and he swims as far as he can, so that he would die. And so the movie ends, with him swimming out a far distance, and then he just lets himself sink into the water. But then he jumps up to the surface. He cries out, no, no, I want to live, I want to live. And he begins to swim back to shore. You see, he has a problem. <laughs> he swam out a great distance. And now swimming all the way back would be Herculean. And so as he swims, he calls out to God Almighty. He says, dear God, please help me. I promise that if you do, I will donate 50% of all the money that I make for the rest of my life. He continues to swim and he's getting closer, but he still has a long way to go. He again calls out to God and he says, Dear God, please help me. And if you do, I promise you that I will donate 25% of all the money that I make for the rest of my life. So with great effort, he continues to swim. Now he's almost there. He just needs one more push and he'll make it. So he calls out to God Almighty one last time. He says, Dear God, Please help me. I promise that if you do, I will donate 10% of all the money that I make for the rest of my life. But then he adds, come on, God, who gives you 10%? I think that doctors look at the facts that they see, and they make a diagnosis. God Almighty looks into the soul of the patient and gives them an opportunity to do tshuva, repentance. He listens to their words of sorrow and remorse, but he questions their sincerity. So before they pass on, he tests them with feelings of recovery to ascertain whether their feelings of contrition were real or just empty promises 
brought on because of the fear of death. As we see with Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and his reaction to the plagues that Moshe brought on the Egyptians. As long as the plague was causing him pain and discomfort, he agreed to send the children of Israel out of Egypt. However, once the plague ended, so did his permission to leave end. He only agreed under duress, so too with the person who was terminally ill. There are times that God Almighty tests their thoughts of tshuva, repentance, to see whether they are truly sincere. We also read in the portion of Shoftim, in the fifth book of the Torah there it states that before the nation went into battle, the officers would announce three exemptions for those who would be allowed to leave before the battle began. It states if someone had built a new house and not dedicated, let him go home and return home least lest another man dedicate it. Verse 6 continues, if someone had planted a vineyard and has not used its fruit, let him go home and return to his house lest he die in battle, and another man be will use his fruit. And then in verse number 7 it states, And if there is a man who has betrothed a wife, and has not yet lived with her, let him go and return to his house, lest he die in battle, and another man will take her. From these three scenarios we learn a great deal about human nature. After each case it states that another man will dedicate your house, eat your fruit, or take your wife. So the question you must ask is, so what if someone else enjoys what you have left behind? The Ger Rebbe states, what the Torah is telling us that in the last moments of his life, instead of this soldier thinking about tshuva, repentance, the fear is that this dying soldier will be thinking about his house, his vineyard, and or his wife. He will have lost the greatest of opportunities to gain his entrance into the world to come in a moment with his dying breath. The Torah Tavlin states, and instead of leaving this world on a positive note, he demonstrates that he is suffering from poor midot, poor character traits. His concern is not that he will be unable to use his things. He is upset that someone else will. He should be happy that someone else will be able to enjoy the house that he built, the vineyard that he planted, or the woman that he betrothed, not begrudging their joy especially at the last moment of his life. You know, every scenario that we experience in our lives contributes to the story that is our life. There can be no scenario greater than those that are connected with pain and suffering. These are many times the stairway that leads us up to heaven. We witnessed with the, that with the last generation that left Egypt. After the sin of the spies, all the men between the ages of 20 to 60 who had left Egypt were condemned by God to die in the desert. Every year, after the decree, on the evening of the ninth day of the Hebrew month of Av, all those men would dig their own graves and spend the night lying in them. In the morning, Moshe would call out, let the living separate from the dead. Each year, some 15,000 men would die. But then in the last year before the nation entered the land, the last of the men of that generation dug their graves and waited for the certainty of their deaths to occur. But somehow, the next morning, all those men were still alive. So they slept in their graves for the next five nights, thinking that maybe they had made a miscalculation about the date. But then on the 15th day of the month, when they viewed the full moon in the evening sky, they realized that God Almighty had commuted their sentence and that they would live and not die. This is the reason that the 15th day of the month above is considered to be one of the happiest days of the Jewish calendar. What brought about their salvation? I think the fact that they had spent the previous 37 years digging their own graves and spending the night in them. I would think that every year they spoke to God their Father in Heaven and asked Him for His forgiveness for their transgressions. I would think that every year they grew little by little until they reached the spiritual plateau so that on the last year they had perfected their souls. They dug their graves that year, certain that they would die, but they had prepared themselves for the moment, and God accepted their tshuva. He commuted their sentence, and they all lived. So we see that though they thought they were preparing themselves for death, instead, in reality, they were preparing themselves for a much deeper and better life. No, we may not consciously ask God Almighty for old age, 
sickness, and or a deathbed experience. But our forefathers, knowing what is best, chose it for us. Let us not waste the opportunity. It may well be our last. We need to remember that the short-term gain that we experience in life may well afford us a much greater long-term gain. If I said gain, I meant pain. And with that, let us help to usher in the coming of Mashiach Zucchino quickly and then in our time. Again, thank you for attending. Again, God should bless you with all that's good. Um, be happy, be healthy, be safe. The next week, I will be at a wedding in New York, so we will not be a class. I think there will be one week before the holidays. I believe that will be the case, and we'll have one more class. And then we'll probably take off for the holidays of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. We'll see how that works. But anyways, thank you so much for listening, and the God should bless you. If I see the Torah, if they good year, a healthy year for you and your family, you should only know good. Uh, and again, hopefully we'll get together one more time. But again, God should bless you and yours with everything that is good. Thank you for attending. Shabbat Shalom.